Today, we'll be taking a close look at stateless authentication providers in ServerStack, the different options, how they work, and go through some of the advantages and trade-offs of using providers like JSON Web Tokens in your application. Stateless authentication providers are those that don't keep track of the user session when a user authenticates with your system. In previous videos, we have looked primarily at different auth providers that, once authenticated, create a user session that is then referenced by a cookie in subsequent requests. Stateless auth providers instead need the client to provide the token or credentials with each request they make. The session object within ServerStack still gets populated like other auth providers, so the way to fetch and use user data via a session doesn't change, but this data is only populated on the iRequest object rather than persisted in a central cache referenced by a cookie or some other session ID. In the first ServerStack Fundamentals video on authentication and authorization, we looked at the credentials auth provider and all the components involved. If you're not familiar with concepts in ServerStack like the iAuth provider, iAuth repository, or user auth, it would be worthwhile giving that a watch first before coming back to this video. Before we dive into some examples, we're going to start by generating a ServerStack application with example authentication already wired up, and use that as a base for configuring and testing the different stateless authentication providers. We can use the Getting Started page on the ServerStack website to start with a template that already contains some of the configuration we need. Go to servicestack.net forward slash start and provide a name for your project and add the features auth, an auth repository of RDBMS, and under RDBMS, select SQLite. Next, we will select the view SPA template to use with these features since the template already has a registration UI we can use for this example. We won't focus on the UI since we'll be working with authentication providers that are most commonly used with system to system integrations such as API key and JWT. Once downloaded, unzip the project into a directory and open using your favorite IDE for .NET. Open and navigate to the app host project which will have the same name as you provided on the Getting Started page. Here we will see several configure c -sharp files in the root of this project. The configure.auth file configures the auth feature plugin, which is the starting point for our application initializing the different components needed to set up authentication. The template comes with four auth providers already configured, but we will want to make some changes to show the use of each different stateless auth provider. First, we will remove the three OAuth providers, leaving only the credentials provider in place, and add two of the stateless authentication providers that we're going to explore first. They are the basic auth provider and the API key auth provider. We will also explore the JWT auth provider later on, but we will configure this when we get to it. To start, we can add both the basic and the API keys auth provider by calling the constructor and passing in the app settings instance. Next, in the config.db.cs file, we will want to change our SQLite connection string to use a file name instead of the database being purely in memory, so we don't lose our changes. Moving to the service interface project and the myservices.cs file, let's also add the authenticate attribute to our hello service, specifying the provider basic. This is just a quick way to force the basic auth provider to prompt us for access for the first example. Lastly, before running the application, also be sure to run npm install from the app host project to make sure all of our JavaScript dependencies are installed for the web UI. So we have a user to work with, let's run the application and go to the register page and register the built-in example new user, unchecking the auto login since we don't want the user to be authenticated with the default credentials provider. Starting from the top, our first stateless auth provider is the basic auth provider. This supports the basic auth form of authentication which has had its specification around for more than 20 years. Every request made needs to have the authorization request header populated with the word basic followed by a base64 encoded string of the username and password. Let's have a look at the flow of the process when a user makes a request to an authenticated service using basic auth to authenticate. Here we have our service stack application set up with the basic auth provider and a hello service that requires authentication. Specifying the provider name in the attribute forces the authentication provider to run the isAuthorized method, which will force our browser to prompt us for credentials for this example. 
When our browser application sends the first request to the Hello service, no credentials are passed in the request since the web application assumes anonymous access. The Authenticate attribute picks up the request as a part of a normal request filter process and returns a 401 unauthorized. And since most browsers have built-in support for a basic auth client, we get a challenge for credentials when receiving the 401 response with the accompanying www authenticate header populated with basic and a specific realm. Once the user provides valid credentials to access the authenticated service, another request is fired, but this time with the authorized header populated with the base64 encoded username and password we specified. The authenticate attribute filter then runs a process against the request called pre-authenticate using any registered auth providers that implement the iAuth with request interface. This locates the registered basic auth authentication provider and runs the implemented pre-authenticate method. The basic auth provider then extracts the credentials from the authorized header and runs it through the authenticate service internally. This is the same hosted authenticate service that is generally called by external clients for session-based auth providers, but this process won't result in a persisted session, so the same process has to happen every single request to an authenticated service. The auth provider then validates the provided credentials with the registered iAuth repository before continuing to call the original authenticated service. When subsequent requests are made from the browser, we aren't challenged with the credentials again. This isn't anything to do with the server, but it's the behavior of the basic auth client built into the browser. If we look on the network tab, we can see the authorized request header is being automatically populated with each additional request, going through the whole process again. The basic auth provider can be useful depending on your requirements, but more than likely there are other ways you'll want to allow your users to authenticate. One of the other stateless authentication providers is the API key auth provider. A common way to allow developers to have easy to use programmatic access to hosted services is to allow them to use a generated API key. These are generated against their user account and are managed separately from user credentials. That is, multiple API keys can be generated for the one account and can be revoked and regenerated without preventing the user authenticating using different authentication providers. Looking in our SQLite database, we can see the API key table that has been created by the API key auth provider if it didn't already exist. Our example user has an entry with two API keys in there since the API key auth provider generates these keys for our users upon registration in the registration feature plugin in our config.auth.cs file. This automatic generation of API keys will also happen on newly created users logging in for the first time with any OAuth provider as well. The API key auth provider already comes with an endpoint for users to regenerate their API keys which revoke the existing keys from the same environment and generates new ones. Like everything else, this is a standard service stack service, so if you need a custom workflow for managing your own keys, you can create your own service to meet your requirements. The programmatic management of keys can be done through the iManage API keys interface of your auth repository. Next, let's have a look at the built-in workflows for the API key auth provider, first looking at what happens during a successful authentication. Here we have an automated process using a generated API key to get the data from an authenticated service. The external system makes the request to the authenticated service which comes with the API key specified in the request. Generally, the API key is specified in the authorization request header using a bearer token, but it can also support query string and basic auth specifying the API key as the username with a blank password. Next, the auth provider validates the provided API key with the database by looking for any match regardless of the specified environment. It does this using the registered auth repository that also needs to implement the iManage API keys interface as the auth repository is also used to fetch the API key details. In our example, we're using the ORM Lite auth repository, which does implement both of the required interfaces. Once the owner of the API key is found, the user auth details are also retrieved using the registered auth repository. These details are used to populate a session object ready to be used in your service X service, and the successful response is returned. As we can see on this diagram, at least two reads from the database are performed per request by default. One to look up the API key itself, and another to fetch the details of the user. This setup will be fine for a lot of use cases, but if you find yourself with high request rate APIs, a short session case duration could drop the number of database queries considerably. 
The session cache duration is a time span that can be populated as configuration on the auth provider itself to enable this cache session behavior. Here we can see the process for a cache miss on the API key auth provider, where the details are retrieved like normal and persisted back to the cache for the specified session cache duration time span. A subsequent request within the time period will produce a cache hit and reduce the amount of work your system has to do as shown in this cache hit process workflow. The API key auth provider is a great way to rapidly support a simplified way for programmatic user access that has built-in services to regenerate them as needed. However, these methods for regenerating and reusing these keys is not a well-known standard and it still needs to retrieve user information from our auth repository every request without some form of caching. Which leads us to our last provider we're going to look at, which is the JWT auth provider, which supports authenticating using JSON web tokens. JSON Web Tokens or JWT became a proposed standard in 2015 and has seen large scale adoption in recent years thanks to a combination of traits like ease of use, stateless authorization, and general flexibility. Broadly speaking, a JSON Web Token is a string made up of three Base64 URL encoded parts separated by a dot. This first part is the header containing signing metadata, and the second part is the payload containing the information about the user, and the last is the signature for the previous two parts so that the contents can be validated as genuine. The token itself should be treated as a sensitive piece of data, as it is what is used to authenticate just like a username and password, API key, or other means of authentication. And since JWT also has a payload of user data, it can also have sensitive information, which by default can be easily decoded by others. Let's add the JWT auth provider to our example application. Unlike the other auth providers, you'll need to specify an auth key to sign and verify tokens in your system. If you're using Rider, you can generate one in C Sharp Interactive by referencing your Appos project in the interactive session, specifying a using statement for the service stack namespace and running the following command. Once generated, you should save this key somewhere secure and load it using your app settings or other mechanism. For this example, I am just going to read it straight from a string for clarity. Logging in using credentials with our example user, we can see in the response we are getting a bearer token and a refresh token. The bearer token is used to authenticate, and it also contains a snapshot of essential data including authorization data like roles and permissions. The refresh token is used to refresh the bearer token, getting updated details and getting a new expiration date. If we want to have a look at the contents of a JSON web token, we can use the serviceact.netx tool by using the command x inspect JWT followed by the access token. If you don't have the x tool installed, you can install it using the command .NET tool install gx. In our new user, we can see there isn't many details, but role and permission information will also be persisted in this token. Here we can see an example of an admin user with more information populated in the token. Something to keep in mind when deciding what data to populate in your JSON web token is that this data will be transferred every request, so it's best to limit the data persisted to essential user and security information only. We can also see it has a created and expiry date which by default are two weeks apart. So now we have an idea of what a JSON web token is and how they work, let's look at a diagram showing a successful authentication. The web application makes a request to an authenticated service which gets picked up by the authenticate attribute request filter and forwarded to the JWT auth provider. From there, the auth provider already has everything it needs to not only verify the authentication, but to create the user session object for this request so that it can be used to check roles and other user information along the way. No need to fetch additional information from a cache or database, making it a great performing method of authentication. Like the API key auth provider, JWT auth providers have a good use case for programmatic access. However, unlike the API key auth provider, JWT cannot stand alone as the only way to authenticate. If the user is going to authenticate with a JSON web token, it needs to be generated using a different authentication provider. We can create an easy to use, automatically updating bearer token using some of the service stack clients. If we inspect the refresh token itself, we can see it has a one year expiration by default before a client would need to re-authenticate using another auth provider. It is only when the access token is being updated that the JWT auth provider will access your database and other resources instead of performing these actions every request, and it is the client that is caching the response. 
This client caching of the stateless token highlights one of the trade-offs made with the JSON web tokens. Your server can't revoke the token without having some kind of central block list of the known tokens you want to block. A mitigation for this trade-off that doesn't require additional centralized infrastructure is to reduce the bearer token expiration to be short-lived. For example, if we change the option expires token in to just 10 minutes, a suspended account will not be able to get a new bearer access token using their refresh token. This will effectively block that user's access with a maximum 10 minute lag since they are no longer able to generate new access tokens. The JWT auth provider also allows custom hooks into various filters, so if you want better control over automating tasks like custom token validation rules or populating custom data, those overrides are built in to enable those types of extensions. The stateless nature of JSON web tokens also lends itself to microservice architecture, where clients might be interacting with multiple microservices or requiring authentication. Provided all are configured with the matching auth key, they can all validate the user token independently and internally make additional requests on the user's behalf. The original authentication service can be isolated into a single externalized system. The last thing to mention about the JWT auth provider is its support for JWE tokens. The JWE specification standardizes the way to represent encrypted content in your tokens. Instead of three base64 URL encoded strings, the JWE standard consists of five, which is the additional information needed to enable securely encrypted information to be transferred without relying on TLS to secure the information. The standard JSON web tokens we have shown here should always be used in conjunction with TLS transport encryption, since the contents of a JSON web token are only signed, not encrypted. If you want more information for how to set up supporting JWE, check out the link in the description to our docs on this support. Stateless auth providers enable automated system-to-system -system integration for developers to easily authenticate with your systems in a variety of secure ways. The API key auth provider is easy for developers to use, independent from passwords, and has a quick to enable session cache functionality for high throughput use cases. This can be a great business to business integration story for highly automated systems. The JWT auth provider is based on a newer standard with built in management of refreshing access tokens, extremely high performance, and is extensible for many different architectures. The traits of JWT and encoding all required authentication and authorization information into a serialized signed string also means they can be used as cookies. This enables their use across any HTTP client that supports the use of authenticated cookies without the need for additional queries in your server application. These are both great options that work side by side, and it all comes down to your requirements and use case. Well that's it for this video, I hope it's been useful, and if you have any topics you would like to see explored in depth as a part of the Fundamentals series, please let us know in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching.